How's it going? Andrew here and welcome to another episode of the Creative Endeavor podcast. In this episode, I'm interviewing Brendan Darby, who's a prominent Western Australian artist and a really talented guy. In fact, I originally reached out to Brendan when I was about 20, 21 years old, before I'd even started out on my professional art journey. I was feeling really jaded and lost after my fine art university experience and wasn't quite sure how I would fit into the art world or even how to go about selling my art. I wasn't even sure about what kind of art I wanted to make. And so in my confusion and out of that loss, I reached out to Brendan Darby, who I really looked up to at the time and he was so generous with his advice and it really helped me out a lot. So naturally, I wanted to reach out to him again and get him on the podcast and see if he could share some of those encouraging words with us. And we had a great conversation. So without further ado, here's Brendan Darby. Said, Brendan, welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks, Andrew. It's nice to be invited. <laughs> Look, I just want to kind of uh, take us back a little bit here. I, I don't think you'll remember, but I remember. Um, and I, I put this to you in the email that I sent you. Um, you're one of the first people that I emailed straight out of university. Or actually, I think, truth be told, I think I was still in my third year feeling really just out of it, jaded, really upset with the state of the art world, wasn't sure how I was going to make it. And I had one of my lecturers just say, well, look, Andrew, if you want to be a commercial artist, you want to go and do that and then go and live your life and just be the next Brendan Darby. And at that time, <laughs> and, and I, I and <laughs> at that time, I, I hadn't actually heard of you. And so I thought, who's Brendan Darby? I looked you up and I thought, damn, this guy can paint. Damn, he's painting <laughs> landscapes. I want to paint landscapes. And I looked at your work and I thought, wow, that it just it just summed up for me perfectly what the vision of it, living an artistic life would look like. And I got in touch with you and I emailed you and I I I you know was asking you all sorts of questions. So I'm not sure if you remember, but um, was that 2003 uh, ish? 2003, that? yeah, yeah, three, yeah, yeah. I you know, I can't say I remember all of it, but um, I'm at my age not gifted with total recall, you know. So I <laughs> anything more than a week back is crazy. <laughs> well, look, it, you were you were really helpful. You responded to the email first. Top marks for that. Oh, that's, like, that's good. You good. know, not many people uh, responded. And I think the main <clears throat> thing that I was struggling with, and maybe where we can kick this conversation off, the main thing that I was struggling with at the time was I had this idea that if I sold my work, then I wasn't a proper artist. And I really had a hard time with that concept because I wanted to be commercial. I wanted to, to live and eat and pay the rent and pay my bills, sell my work. And hmm. there was some, somehow this idea that was just running, just kind of, it was like this unspoken rule in art school that, hey, if you do that, you're not proper artist. You've got to kind of struggle and live for your ideas. And I thought, well, how am I going to pay the rent with that? Sure. I've had the same problem. I... Um... I remember having a conversation with a, a very good artist who shall remain nameless in this conversation. Um, but I was introduced to her over lunch and she said, oh, um, oh, yes, that's right. You sell your work, don't you? I said, yes, I do. And uh, she said, well, why do you do that? I said, because it enables me to continue painting. And she said, oh, I've, no, I think it's selling out to sell your work. And And the thing was, and I don't knock this idea as well. There's quite a lot of artists out there that live off the grant system, off the government, and never really attempt to sell their work. It's just one grant after another. They, they're they in the system. And uh, again, I don't have a problem with that. But because she was disparaging to me at this particular uh, luncheon, I had to say to her, look, I, I understand your position, but my position is I want to paint. And through my painting and selling my work, I'm paying taxes, which is actually paying for your grants. You know, so it, it's it, it goes around, you know, it just goes around. I, I don't see any problem at all in anyone selling their art. When you think about it, it happens in all of the arts. Can you think of, I don't know, a famous uh, ballet star or um, opera singer that doesn't get paid to perform or, you know, an actor, um, musicians? How do they survive? They right. sell their records or, yeah, you know, so why can't artists sell their work? 
Mm. I don't get it. Don't get it. And it enables us to continue painting without having to take a real job, as we call them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a, a real job, a Joe job. Um, That's it. Yep. You know, but mind you, we, we all, well, I, I started working a real job and grinding it out, washing dishes and working in a giant milk fridge in Perth um, for a long time. Um, yeah. And, and, yeah, yeah, you know, you, you do your bit pouring beers and making coffees until you can finally sell enough work that you're like, see ya. You know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I was lucky because I was a professional musician while I was studying art and fortunately and i've been very very lucky I, I have to stress this just things about timing i don't know quite why but it worked really well for me uh, my music was really starting to go well while i was studying graphic design which is another conversation we can get into graphic design mm. but um i left a three-year diploma in graphic design to play music full time and after several years doing that i thought oh hang on i've had enough of clubs and pubs I want to get back to painting and of course promptly went broke <laughs> you know but sort talk about out of the frying pan into the fire yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, i was lucky i could supplement my income while i was trying to get established in the in the painting world by doing part-time music work so it was I, again very lucky really lucky it was that time you know this is the 70s so live bands were playing everywhere i was Prior to committing to painting, I was touring Australia a lot. It was just a beautiful time to be doing all of that. Tough for pro painters, though, because there weren't many wow. commercial galleries. There were hardly any professional painters in Perth. Wow. I use the term painter because I, I, I have trouble generalising with the term artist. I think we need another name for it. Why is visual, that? Visual, visual artists. I don't know. Visual artists doesn't cover it for me either. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, when I when I look at somebody like you and the the sheer variety in, in the types of images that you paint, I mean, you're a guy with a lot to say about a lot of different things. I mean, I, when I first became familiar with your work, you were doing these epic landscape scenes, you know, a lot of areas that I was just dying to get to, like, you know, outback Western Australia, the Kimberley. Um, and very, you got there. You, yeah, I, you eventually, got there. eventually I got there. Mm. Um, and But your take on it was really inspiring. And then and then seeing what you were doing with these these amazing water effects with paint in more recent years. But then on top of that, I mean, you mentioned, you know, music. You're a really talented musician as well. So what do you play besides trumpet? It's trumpet. It's your main kind of. Yeah. Your yeah. Trumpets. Trumpets really it. Uh, there was a time when uh, trumpets went out of fashion again, late 70s, early 80s, when rock really took over. And my father was a drummer, and so I'd played a bit of drums. So I did play drums for a little while, but, you know, it was uh, just a little filler, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I, I write music on keyboards, but I'm not a keyboard player per se. You know, that's just my vehicle to get sounds down. No, I'm a trumpeter. Yeah. Fantastic. Hey, let yeah. me let me ask you, though, while we're, while we're on the subject of, of music and painting, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is, is how – how do those two connect and kind of cross fertilize for you? Cause I, I find mm. that really fascinating. There seems to be a musical rhythmic aspect to your paintings. Yeah. Um, probably by chance, uh, as I recall, I, I always, well, nearly always listen to music while I'm painting. Um, I'm a big jazz fan, but not just jazz. I like all sorts of music. And, on a few occasions, it started to occur to me that while I was painting, the music in the background was absolutely perfect or sometimes absolutely wrong. And there was nothing wrong with the music. It just didn't sit with the painting. It was like, uh, I think one of the best ways to describe it would be watching a movie with the wrong film score, yeah. you know, the wrong music. Yeah. You know, it just didn't sit. And so I started thinking, what if it did sit absolutely perfectly with the painting? So the music's written for the painting and trying to describe the same scene, mm. just to give it another dimension. Um, I, I don't want to overstate this, but I felt when it worked, it was greater than the sum of its two parts when it worked. Mm -hmm. And that's not, not all the time. So I understand, I have a better understanding and, and uh, gratitude for the composers that do great film score, because that's a tough, tough gig to get that right. I'm, I'm trying to describe a static image, you know, and that's hard enough. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I just love that process. So I decided to go and do a series, and it happened to be in Kakadu, and went there and sampled some of the sounds, looked at the landscape and tried to look at it in a lyrical way. And, of course, painting, the arts in general, and music share a lot of terminology, and it makes sense. A lot of it just sits together well. Yeah. I would sample things like butcher birds that are territorial and have one call for their location. Mm. And so I could base a melody on that, knowing it's that location that if someone goes there, they'll hear that melody. You know, that sort of thing. Cool. Good fun. <laughs> Good fun. Mm. Um, no, I, d- I wanted to ask you that because I, I, I remember seeing a little YouTube clip um, ages ago on, on your work with Kakadu. And I, and I remember these sounds and you're recording things and then the image would be, it was a beautifully edited little clip I was watching. It was fantastic. I think I, I either saw it on YouTube or your website, but it was, it was a long, long time ago. Um, hmm. I, I, I'm not sure exactly which bit you're referring to because I've done lots of it. I, hmm. I tend to call the process listening to paintings, which is you know yeah. just a general yeah. description. I've, I've done a series from Kakadu, as I've just described. And then I decided to take on a much bigger project and do it Australia-wide and try to go to the most diverse landscapes in Australia. So snowfields to deserts, you know, um, Tasmania up to the tropics, all of that stuff, the deserts, um, southwest coast, Kimberleys, Kakadu, all of that. Wow. And and, and write a piece for um, for each one. So there's there was 10 major pieces that resulted from that exhibition called listening to paintings australia where does he get them you know yeah. <laughs> and uh and uh yeah and, and 10 pieces of music and that was actually um premiered live with a live music performance against a film clip of the works being created which was again good fun oh fantastic <laughs> what a great was idea it- it was a 10-year project. It wasted 10. didn't waste. No, it took 10, <laughs> 10, took 10 years to get together. <laughs> I imagine that was really well received, though. Like, I mean, what was the reaction like in the crowd when you finally got to show that thing? Or how did you feel when you, when you finally delivered that body of work? <clears throat> um, there were a few hiccups in the presentation as it happens. So all sorts of things. Anything that could go wrong did go wrong. The computer oh. crashed. But this is before while we're trying to get it on stage and... Yeah. Uh, I, I won't give you the details, but yeah, a lot of people found it very, very interesting. But because of the concept of looking at a painting and listening to a piece of music, it's difficult for a lot of people. Some people wouldn't look at a painting. In fact, you probably know this. The average time a person spends looking at a painting, this is the average in commercial and public galleries, mm. is four seconds. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Which, which is very scary, yeah. really, isn't it? Yeah. Well, so, yeah. so, so, so to expect someone to look at one of my pieces for the duration of the music, and some of it went for five minutes, some would go for two minutes, you know, it just depended on the, the inspiration. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say it's been, um, well, I can tell you it hasn't been an outrageous commercial success, but I, I love doing it and I still keep doing it. I, I just love that process. Um, some of the music has been used for uh, commercially on TV shows um, not associated with the painting itself, but that's okay. I guess right. that uh, just suggests to me that they can stand on their own, which is good. That's awesome. That's awesome. Mm. So what... There's so many things I want to ask you. Maybe maybe what we could do is just go back because, you know, one of the <clears throat> one of the questions that I also get quite often is, you know, this... This idea, I think, I think what a lot of young people are struggling with is this idea like, like their art career is this monumental dream and they just keep putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. And, and, and if it's out there on the horizon, if it's far away out of reach, then it can't hurt them, but they can still dream about it. So they keep it there a little bit as a comforting feeling, but if they have it just out of reach, then, then it's okay. What would you say to somebody who was just, I mean, because you, you've done this, man. I mean, you've lived it, you're breathing it, you're, you're an inspired guy, you're creating great work. Um, and, and I love what you're saying. I mean, look, even though that might not be a commercial success, you're driven by the love for the work. So what could you say to somebody who's just wanting to start this thing <clears throat> off and, and just kind of find their way? Uh, social media, of course, helps now a lot by posting some of the work you like yourself. And so you can gauge public, the public reaction to it with all those naughty, naughty likes. And then <laughs> uh, it, 
in the old analog days, and when I was first starting, and this is still available, I think, to new artists, try to get involved in your local community art shows, the mixed mixed shows at um, schools and, uh, you know, the type I'm talking about. They're still very common. Uh, and the best thing about that is if you're just starting, you can walk into this place and no one will know you and you can hover somewhere near your painting and listen to honest comments on it. You'll, you'll hear what people really think, but have broad shoulders because you are going to cop it, you know. Yeah. But it's, re it's a really good education. It also in a strictly commercial sense, gives you an idea of where your paintings sit commercially amongst all of the other people trying to get into this marketplace. You'll see if yours sells quickly or doesn't sell at all. You'll see how much work sells at that, that place at a certain price point. You'll soon learn where you fit uh, commercially, I'm, I'm saying, and whether people like what you're trying to tell them. It doesn't mean that what you're doing is wrong if they don't like it because there's a very good chance you're above them you know this is a fairly um I, I don't want to use any disparaging terms but it's it's not the top end of the art market here the, these people in suburban schools mm -hmm. but it is a good good cross-section of your community and and what the average person is going to think of your work you get a, a good honest answer you won't have people just saying nice things to keep you happy you'll hear the truth have you got any tips for how to handle the truth when you hear it even if it's <laughs> the ugly truth. Well, I've had years of ugly truths. <laughs> um, no, there is no way. I think this is why God made beer. You know. <laughs> Fair enough. No, uh, no, it's okay. I just think if you're if you're passionate about whatever the work is you're producing in a certain direction you're going, stay with it because that's what in the end creates an unusual and original artist. Mm. It's not the one that complies and paints what the GP wants, mm, you know, mm, yeah, it's someone absolutely. who's different. And, and if, if you're different, it's going to be tougher to start with much tougher. You know, I think, I think you're touching on something there that's quite important because that speaks to the motivations by which somebody would be doing it in the first place. You know, are they doing it because their mom's going to be proud of them and they're going to put it to the fridge and, and say, Hey, look, what, <laughs> what, look what little Billy did. You know, are, sure. are you doing it for the pat on the back? Or are you doing it because there's something in you that has to get out? Um, and I, yeah. oh I, yeah, you know, I, I, I think the latter is certainly has got more longevity, you know, that's, that's the most important, of course. But I, I suspect at that stage, everything you said then is, is probably a part of that equation. As long as that last situation rings true and comes through in the end, if, yeah. if you, if you're just there for, I don't know, a bit of glamour or no, there's nothing wrong with glamour or fun either. But if, if, if you're not as Andrew is driven by some of the great works you've seen in the past and want to work, you know, with significance like that, then yeah, maybe, maybe think of something else. Maybe. Mm. Yeah. But that, yeah. but that's a moving target as well. That can build as you start working and you get further involved, you, you change directions and the inspiration may come. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, um, I'm very vague on that one. It's a, it's a no, tricky one. No, 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 no. I mean, look, I'm just uh, I'm trying to work this stuff out for myself as well. And I find that um, in, every time I hit that that area where I feel like I'm just starting to get it, some mm. other challenge or something else gets thrown in my path. And it's like, no, you don't get it at all. There's even more to know. Um, Isn't that great? Well, it's wonderful. And it's really humbling. Um, but, you know, th there is a brief moment where you're you're kind of you know, kind of puffing yourself up a bit and feeling really good about things. And then suddenly you're, you're humbled, you know, and, and, and it, it can be quite sudden. The artists that I can't stand, uh, the ones that I really, and I, I must admit, I don't really hang around a lot of artists because we don't get along so well. But I mean, <laughs> but I, being here in New Zealand and fortunately in Perth, it was a, it was a really good crowd, but you, you occasionally come across some artists who think they've got it all figured out. Mm. And, and there's nothing else that you can... It's not that I, I would feel in those situations I'd have something to offer them, but I just kind of want to kind of hear a little bit more of a human aspect or see that there was a, a work in progress, so to speak. Um, yeah. You know. well, one, thing, one thing I've learned over these several decades, many decades, I used to get a bit excited about some works. You know, I think, oh, that's a ripper. You know, that's really come together well and you'd feel proud of it and someone would buy it and it'd disappear and you wouldn't see it. And, and then accidentally maybe 10 years later you'd walk in on it 
And every time I do that, I look at it and say, what was I thinking? You know, so uh, at one level, it, it's a dampener, but at, at another, I never get too excited about where I'm at at any given point. You know, I know that down the line, it's not going to mean quite as much. And I think that's a positive thing. It just means that you're moving on and you're still experimenting. You're still looking for more. If you were content, if I was content 30 years ago, why would I keep doing it? Yeah, yeah, mm. absolutely. Absolutely. No, I, I, I get the, the same feeling as well, looking at past work and, and reflecting on those feelings that, you know, after putting the brushes down, you know, being like, hey, that was awesome. And then, and mm. then you know, it's, <laughs> my old folio always comes back to haunt me. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's one of these things. But look, now, you know, you I, I'm. I, I feel. Hopefully, you can you can give us the, the backstory here and tell us um, how it's all working for you now, and and maybe that that story will inspire. Well, I know it will inspire some people. But I, I look at your work now, and and I, I see what you're doing online. You know, through your Instagram page, and and kind of I, I I keep up to date with what's happening at galleries here and there. Where do you find yourself now? What's inspiring you now? And and what do you what are you working on currently? Well, there, there's a couple of things. Uh, I know you've been doing a bit of work with digital art as well, although mm -hmm. you, you don't see that as a, a final work. Um, and this is an interesting dilemma, I think, because I believe that digital art world is um, becoming way more acceptable. I mean, David Hockney, for example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and, and I've been working on it for a few years now and found the resistance. A lot of people think you're cheating. They think it's a manipulated photograph. It's, you know, it's the computer doing it. There's a lot of that out there. Um, but I'm finding as I, as I keep working on it, some people are starting to get it and come online. Mm. I'm, not sh I'm not sure how the current project I'm working on, which is called 2018, where does he get them? That's a, an iPad painting that I'm painting every day on the same painting. So whatever happens today, it might be our interview. I don't know. Uh, that that will be the subject of, of the painting. It'll be added to the painting. Yeah. And of course, as you, you're aware, Procreate, the, um, the app I'm using, records everything in movie form. So every brushstroke, every mark is recorded. So at the end of this year, I'll have 365 days recorded. I'll have a visual diary of everything the major events in every day of this year that influence me wow um, I, I have no idea what i'm going to do with that when it's done i'm i'm saving high res some high res images along the way so it might i, I don't know it may end up in an exhibition with a with this video that just runs in loops i don't know we'll see but i like that idea that it's open-ended i i just like doing it knowing that there's some surprises coming perhaps mm. if, if it was all resolved it wouldn't be as exciting as it is mm. and I, i've already found certain things i should have thought about at the start of the year and i would have formatted it differently i would have saved every day for example mm. but i think that's the interesting thing about this sort of creative process as long as it continues to be creative you know, th there's something to look forward to if you knew every day what was going to happen why would you bother uh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I must admit, I, I've experienced some of the similar uh, resistance to the new digital medium, but I, I find mm. it amazing how it, it literally touches everything in our, our modern day culture and society. I mean, we see digital art everywhere. And why, mm. why is it taking so long to kind of permeate into the fine art space or the painting space? Um, I, I do, I use it as kind of a means to an end, but I must admit like the digital art that gets me, I mean, when you're watching a TV show or a movie, concept art is what gets me, you know, with, mm. you know these environments and scenes that don't exist. So you've got to have teams, oh, yeah. of, teams of artists to do something like The Hobbit or Lord of the Rings or something like that. Sure, you know, it's and incredible, I, yeah. Yeah, mm. and, I, and I, I love that sort of thing. But, you know, you, you're you're doing it the hard way because I mean, if I, if I had to do, knowing me, if I had to do a picture on the iPad, I wouldn't go back over the top of that. I mean, okay, maybe you could save and take images along the way, but mm. you know, I would, I would do it. I'd finish. So I think that's quite brave in a way to just kind of let the process then take you where it needs to go. 
Well, I'm, I'm a big fan of abstraction. I'm not very good at it because um, probably because of my graphics training and whatever other influences I've had. But I really find it hard to do um, a non-objective abstract. I need, a, I need a pathway to it somehow, some sort of reference. It might end up looking totally abstract to the viewer, but it, it will have a reference from somewhere, another landscape or something. So what happens in this iPad project is I already have a painting on there and I'm trying to add another element, another image. It might just be a line drawing, might be just some color. Uh, I don't know. But as a result, a lot of it becomes very abstract. And I really like that process. It sort of frees me up a bit or forces me to loosen up, mm, mm. Which, I, which I'm not very good at. You were also talking about uh, projects. Uh, I'm, I'm not very good at um, planning way ahead. I tend to look a year ahead, maybe a year and a half ahead, and book exhibitions in commercial galleries. Uh, and because I'm a lazy bastard, it, the only way it's going to be done is... I have to book the exhibition. Then I know I'll do it. It will be done. Right. If I didn't have if I didn't have that deadline, you know, I'd be I'd be pushing it a bit, you know, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that so that's the way I have to do it. Um, you you don't work a lot with commercial galleries, as I understand. Is that right? I have a, a really bad attitude, Brendan. I um I'm probably have a bit of a reputation now for being uh, quite difficult um oh and, and i'm i'm now beginning, that's unusual that's unusual uh, for an artist well <laughs> i'm beginning to soften a little bit but i've i mean i've had some really great experiences um i had some mm -hmm. wonderful experiences in perth um you know and a few horror stories as well that some of my listeners will will no doubt know about now um yep. but um i now with with online with the online world i find that i'm getting opportunities and commissions and clients um they're coming to me now um and, but <clears> I, <throat> I i'm i'm in this position now though where it's like well i, I want to do bodies of work for commercial galleries um, i'm talking with another friend of mine about maybe doing a joint show with him and so i'm forging new new relationships with galleries um you know here in new zealand because i just moved to new zealand i, I married a kiwi girl uh, about six years mm. ago ago and and now we live in the bottom of the South Island. I love it. It's an amazing landscape. And um, and you're moving to Queenstown or you've already well, moved? No, no, no. So I'm in my permanent home now. And um, we tried to get into Queenstown, but uh, we weren't millionaires yet. <laughs> oh, oh so, has Queenstown got that expensive? Has it? I love Queenstown. Oh, it's mate, beautiful. It mm. is off the mm. hook how expensive oh, it yeah. is. But it's stunning. Oh. It's stunning. Um, but it, it's, it, I'm waiting for a good market crash and then I'll go in and buy something maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but, Apparently um, it's on the way. It, yeah, yeah. It, it Look, it's only two and a half hours down the road from me now, but the landscape down here, I mean, I, I actually now with the, the lifestyle here, I, I, I kind of prefer it because, um, you know, this reminds me, uh, we're, we're coming around full circle here, but this, I saw something recently and it kind of reminds me of, of your approach to things in a certain way. And I, I just want to touch on something you just said, because I and I'm going to want to challenge it um, because I mm. don't I don't know if I necessarily agree with you, because I look at your work. I have to be going. I have to be going now. What? Oh, OK. Joking. 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 <laughs> joking. Hang on. Jeez, you got me. No, gotcha. you'll like this. You'll like this okay. because you, you said you're a lazy bastard. I don't agree with you. I don't think that can be true because I look at the amount of work that I've seen that you've done. And the amount of public collections that you're in and the, the shows that you've done and, and this new experimental work with with booking a show so far in advance. Do you find that that's a way to um, rather a, a way to kind of force yourself to structure time around works? Or would you be mm -hmm. if, if you didn't if you didn't have that that goal of, of OK, show time is November. We got to get there that you might just continue to work on the same piece. But. Uh, you strike me as the kind of guy that would just show up to work every day to paint, just play. Um, most days, that's true. Doesn't mean I necessarily do paint or play. I I turn up to do it, and I I don't know if you have this. A lot of artists do. It's um, um, we call it the coffee syndrome. Really, you you walk in, you're going to paint. You think, well, especially if you're starting a new piece, oh, I better have a coffee first and. Oh, those emails. I better check the emails, just get them out of the way and pay those bills. Anything but starting that painting. You know, it doesn't happen to me all the time, but it does happen quite often. Yeah. And it particularly happened to me when I was younger. 
Um, so if I have a deadline, forget the coffee, forget the emails, let's go. Let's get into it. Yeah, yeah. And it also helps me to uh, focus on a theme because I, I like themed exhibitions. Yeah. So I usually have to – I try to work that out before I book the exhibition so they can – they know where we're going. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Mm. Well, uh, yeah, because that, that's interesting. I mean, I had a client ages ago say to me, um, Andrew, I'm, I'm going to – I want this commission. I want it by this date. And I'm going to force you to paint it by that date. And I said, gee, that's really steep. And he said, you know what, Andrew, I know artists. Artists are lazy and having a deadline <laughs> forces you to structure that time. And I, I learned, risk my case. I, I learned that <laughs> lesson. And, and, but I didn't see it as laziness, but I, I, I see it as um, kind of you do tend to get caught in your own head and, and you know, involved in that creative process. And I, oh, I do, you know, anyway. And, and yeah, drink plenty of coffee during the day. Of course. I, 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 but I, I, I agree with you. I think I can't speak for you or anyone else for that matter. But I think most of the time, whether you're painting or not, you're working. Hmm. You're thinking about, OK, how, how am I going to do this or a particular concept or whatever yeah. it is you, you know like that ipad thing i'm talking about yeah. i don't know where it's going to finish so i keep thinking about it and think well what's the best way to, what's the most interesting way to present this so even yeah. when you're not putting brush to canvas you're still working i believe mm. Mm. i, I want to mm. ask you about galleries so when it when it comes to dealing with a gallery I have a lot of people asking, you know, how do I even get into a gallery in the first place? Could you give mm -hmm. us just a rundown of how, how, how does Brendan Darby forge a new relationship with a commercial gallery? How would you approach a gallery? Um, right now? Or as, as a young painter? Or? Yeah. As, how about give us from a young painter, maybe a story of when you hmm. first started? Uh, I think um, I talked about earlier going to your local community exhibitions, joint shows, yeah, yeah. and putting your work up there, putting it out there. You, I think you'll find, especially some of the the more well-established exhibitions in that genre, a lot of gallery people go to them just to see what's out there. In, in fact, often a lot of their artists are involved, so they go along. But they have got their eye open for new and upcoming talent all the time. So that's one way of doing it. But I also believe with uh, social media now this is a whole new world and this is probably the best time ever to try and get into a gallery you don't have to throw them in the back of your car and drag them into a gallery to find the gallery directors not there yeah. so uh it's much easier for them as well to receive a well-presented email or you know whatever mm. with some high good quality images on it uh i'm i'm also interested in what you just said about you have clients coming, it doesn't surprise me, clients coming to you as a result of your posts online. And I've always seen that as, as the only hiccup with um, digital media, digital galleries, social media to sell paintings. Most people, I think, when, when it gets to a certain price point, they need to stand in front of it before they commit. Yes. yes. So, so f from my point of view, that narrows the market to your local market, yes. even, though you're, even though you're promoting it worldwide. So there's a great advantage to it, but at the same time, there's that little point which still justifies commercial galleries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're, you're quite mm -hmm. right. You're quite right. I mean, there's a lot of resistance that I found. You know, I'll get emails from people who will want to commission something. And, and, and you know, sometimes it works. It, it works enough that I, I make a good solid go of it. But I, I will get back to them with a price, you know, based on the size that they want. And then I never hear from them again. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's one of these things that once you establish your price within the art world or within a particular market, why would you insult all of your previous clients and buyers by coming up with something that you feel is, is appropriate at that level? The price is a price and the market has established that. I have to keep it there, you know. It can that's be an interesting. That's an interesting point as well that I've, I've been talking with a lot of people about. I've always found it a bit strange that visual arts paintings are not allowed to move with the rest of the market. Other commodities, precious metals, the stock market, real estate, they all they're up and down. And people that invest in such things expect that. That's the risk they take. But if you, Andrew, were to sell a very nice painting to someone, and then a year later, a similar size, similar subject you put on the market considerably reduced because the market is reduced, you'd be very unpopular with that buyer. And I don't understand why it should. Yeah. It's, it's just the realities of the marketplace and everything else. The yeah. end result is of course, 
that artists that can't move in a really tough market tend to not sell many paintings yeah. while it's really tough. Yeah. And that's equally unfair. But I, I had a, an exhibition a few years back during a tough time and, and was talking to a friend of mine about this problem and decided to have an experiment. So at opening night at this exhibition, I said basically what I just said to you there about why can't art move with the market. And as such, I want to have a little experiment tonight, and this is called price justification. It's where you, the buyer, sets the price. You've all got a catalogue in front of you, and it has a price on it. Well, from now, and for a little while, until I put an end to this, you can buy any one of those pieces at half price. And if someone else wants it, they can bid above that half price, and, and the price will be written against it as we go to see what price the market really wants to pay for these works wow uh, yeah it was a bit scary good idea and um, well sort of it, it didn't really pan out the way i hoped uh what it did tell me though was most of the people that were there were there for the party and the free wine because even at half price <laughs> oh, you know yeah yeah most of them but that, that's the case with most gallery exhibitions you, there are people that are serious about it and the great majority are there for some fun and you know and a social event that's fair enough. That's part of it as well. Yeah. Any, anyway, it, um, yeah, it, I got a lot of blank stares and um, some people got some fairly cheap paintings out of that exercise. Yeah. But it, it didn't, didn't sort of resolve the problem. I didn't get to a point where I said, well, this is what this painting's worth now because the masses have told me, because the masses didn't vote. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah absolutely. No, no wiser, no wiser for the event. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, look, in speaking of the markets, I mean, during that economic, economic turmoil, you know, I lost my business, totally lost my business. So I, I went from a period of 2009, had a sellout show, walked away with, you know, just didn't know what to do with the money. And then mm. the next year, not a, not a thing. And, and oh, just, yeah. just bare bones. And a lot of people and, and that was about the time that all the galleries in WA started dropping like flies. Sure. So how does one kind of how do you how do you kind of bear the brunt and, and kind of weather that storm because the bad times are coming you know economic economic hardship is coming <clears throat> as an artist how do you deal with that i i think you're right i think there's a beauty coming up right up very soon the next year or so yeah i mean it's it's tough now uh i don't think there's any short answer to that i i think the way you're working at the moment on social media and your teaching and all of that is going to help you enormously to get through that, to, to have a stable base to work with because people still want to learn to paint even in the bad times. They may not have the discretionary spend available for a big piece. Mm. I, I've just been very lucky. We've, we've had lots of very lean years and for some reason I seem to just get something, touch wood, a big commission or something like that just to get us over the line. And the last few exhibitions have gone okay, just enough to keep us plodding along. Hmm. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have a simple answer to that. Um, this is not true just for paintings, but what I'm trying to do right now is um, get rid of debt, that's all. Yeah. And that's yeah. hard because you have to sell paintings to get rid of debt. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a, it is a tricky one. Um, I, th I think I think this next generation, as you've stated, is is going to find it far more interesting to get seen, to get to galleries, to get to major um, exhibition competitions, Archie balls and things like that, um, because they all seem to be starting to change over to a digital submission rather than having to pack the painting up from Perth and send it all the way to Sydney at a huge cost and have it sent back, you know, yeah. that, yeah. that, that sort of stuff is, is getting a little easier and will continue to do so. So it'll be mm. easier for the new artists to be seen. Excellent. Excellent. Mm. So on that with, with dealing with competitions, I mean, are competitions important to you as an artist and, and going for awards? Uh, not, not particularly. I, I, I usually intend to enter the Archie board, uh, but as I said to you, I'm, I'm pretty poorly organized and often don't get around to it. Yeah. I was really, I was really lucky just by chance. I, I entered in 2001 and, and got into the, the show, 
which I wasn't expecting. It was the first time I'd tried. And then I thought, oh, this is easy. And I've been trying ever since. And, of course, haven't, <laughs> haven't made it in again. Oh, wow. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I like, I like that sort of comp and some of the bigger comps because it exposes your work to a different, a different audience. You know, mm. Mm. Uh, the significant ones, the Doug Moran Prizes and, and um, Perth Portrait Prize. I've just joined the West Australian Portrait Artists Group and I'm having, they are, we are having a show in two weeks down in Fremantle. And it's the first one I will be having with them, which is good fun. Yep. Fantastic. Who, who's your subject for that show? Well, I'm putting three pieces in. One is a self-portrait um, that was a semi-finalist in the Doug Moran Prize last year. And uh, in fact, there's two self-portraits. The other one is... Um, as a result of one day on the iPad works that I spat out and printed to paper at a reasonable size, you know, uh, saying a little bit about that process mm. alongside the painting. And I'll have a video alongside it or under it showing where it came from, from the very beginning to that point. Fantastic. So it'll show all the brush strokes. Um, again, I have no idea where that's all going, but to do that in that environment i think i'm i might get some feedback that might make me think oh this this is a good way to do it you know mm. who knows <laughs> um and the third the third one is um of who i believe is going to be western australia's new governor general do you know who that is oh i'm out of the loop in WA. yeah been a few years no, I, now. well i wasn't i wasn't aware of this until a few days ago as well but it's kim beasley oh so, wow yeah, okay so, i know well i know who that is yeah yeah, yeah I, paint, I painted him a couple of times. Um, he was in the salon of the Archibald. I think it was the year after I was in the Archibald. Um, and then I did this piece. When he retired from politics, when he he he, he became ill and he, he left politics for a year or two right. and then went back and as leader of the party and lost the election, he couldn't lose. You know, I, I think of Kim as the best prime minister we never had. He was yeah. just... A, a really good, genuine guy still is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like him a lot. Yeah. Well, so he, he's the he's the other piece. Right. Fantastic. Oh, that'll be that'll be a great little collection of work. So who who else have we got in that in that portrait artist group? Who who else has uh, shown well, alongside of you? I'm not going to say. I'm not going to tell you because, as I said, oh. I just joined the group, and, and I, I won't remember. <laughs> I won't remember their names, and then I'll be in trouble. Oh, okay. But, Never mind. But, okay. You know that one anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They they are all fantastic. A really really good bunch of painters. Uh, lots of them have been finalists in Archie Balls and Perth Portrait Prizes. And, yeah, and it's a group of uh, well, eighteen or something, and right. most of them are putting in two or three pieces. Awesome. So I think awesome. it opens on the ninth of next month for anyone looking for something to do. Fantastic. There's, Fantastic. there's the big plug. You know, one of the yeah. things that really inspires me, um, and I, I saw this um, just a few days ago on your Instagram feed, um, where you had a few images on there that showed your studio space. Um, and I just thought mm -hmm. immediately, damn, beautiful, beautiful space, beautiful paintings. And there's something so good about seeing somebody just kind of immersed in their element. And I was looking at that going, wow, you know, I, I still get, I still get that surge of inspiration when I see something because it just kind of puts, it's like, it's like when you're putting together a vision board and you're putting up pictures that really inspire you. And it's like, yep, yeah, one day I'm going to have that, you know, cause I haven't built my studio yet, but I saw, uh -huh. some, I saw some really interesting ideas there in, in your studio. It almost looks like it's open air. Would you like to see it? I'll just turn you around. Let, yeah, Is let's have a look. Good. There's the studio. Oh, I don't know if you're seeing that properly. That is beautiful. Here, lift it up a little bit for us. Tilt it up just a bit. Yeah, gorgeous. Yeah, cool. So, yeah, um, the big part on the right there is can be open. It just has blinds to keep the mozzies and things out. Wow. Um, it, has a, it has a sealed section at the back also that uh, if it gets too hot or too cold, I can go in there. And then the, big, the, the little piece on the front left here is my music studio. So wow. it's a beautiful place to work. It's, um, it took a long time to set this up. I've only been in this since 2015. This section, I built this last open air section on 2015. 
and it's just a gorgeous place to work. It's open, you know, the paint fumes are not destroying me too much. Fantastic. It's gorgeous. Fantastic. Mm. So what are you painting with? Are you using oils? Yep. I work with generally underpainting acrylic if I want heavy textures and then oils over the top for glazes and so on. But uh, you'd be aware of this. The problem I have with finishing in acrylic is trying to match tone. Yeah, yeah. As, as you know, it goes on lighter than it dries or, or vice versa. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And with oil, it's consistent. What you see is what you get when it's dry. Absolutely. So what mm. mediums are you mixing with your oils? Oh, I just use a uh, number five medium to uh, speed the drying process. That's all. That's Which, my life. The, the, I used the, to use spectrum stuff. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I yeah. used to, I used to use um, quite a bit of linseed oil, but of course that slows the drying process. Mm. And I, I guess the reason I'm in the habit of using something that dries reasonably quickly is I'm usually running late, mm. which explains my earlier comment about being poorly organized and having to have a deadline, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so again, that's why I paint, underpaint in acrylic so it dries quickly and the heavy stuff and yeah. then paint over that in, oil, in oils to finish. That's awesome. So I, I've noticed with a few of your works, actually, this is good because uh, it's good that we get just a couple of things. If you got a minute, it's good to get just a sure. couple of yeah, um, yeah. couple of technical things in because people might want to know a little bit more about your process, just whatever you feel comfortable sharing. Um, sure. But I've noticed with some of your works, I mean, uh, the scale of some of these paintings is pretty damn impressive. Like they're huge works. Um, do you do a study or a sketch before you move on to a bigger work or do you just have at it? Um, it depends on the particular piece. I, I did a, a, I had a commission for a painting seven meters high by three meters wide. What? A year, a year or two back. Wow. And uh, yeah, um, so I did a study for that, and the study I think was two meters high, or a meter wide or something, <laughs> just so I could get some idea of what's going on there. Biggest and as it study happens, ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then, then uh, in in uh, preparation and organisation to get this into a private house, which had a, a, a huge open space in the middle of it, we worked out that we wouldn't be able to get it into the house. There was nowhere long enough to get a seven metre piece in through doors, or you know, uh, we couldn't get it in through the roof. So it ended up being a triptych. So I had to paint it in three pieces. Wow. And in the studio I was in at the time, I couldn't stand it up anyway. I was going to have to find somewhere else to paint it. So I would paint one piece up in its normal space, lay the next one on the floor in front of it, stand back behind that, and then the, the third one behind that. And it was pretty difficult, really hard to get perspective right. Mm. Um, mm. But an interesting process. So, yes, I did a study for that one. Uh, normally I don't. I have, for the... The series I talked about earlier, Listening to Paintings Australia, they were all, the final pieces were all three metres by 1.8. And I had done a lot of work at each location, small works on paper, smaller paintings, all sorts of things. And the end result was generally semi-abstract piece of that location because I wanted to get lots of elements into it, too many elements to put into a, a, a representational painting. Mm. So I'd, I'd, I'd want to get in the tropics, for example, a bunch of birds and waterfalls. and So it, it would end up being abstracted. And so I would just look at the other pieces I'd done and refer to them as I'm painting, make it up as I go along. Mm. But I think I, I would suggest to anyone listening that, yeah, do a study. <laughs> do a study. <laughs> you know, the, that's the other good thing about iPad paintings of course it's a good way to try stuff you know you, mm. you can think oh you know let's do a quick study on this and you're not you can be really radical without wasting materials mm. really radical mm. yeah what what stands out to you as one of the most profound experiences in your career one of the things that like really moved you in some way or something that just really uh, almost like a slightly spiritual experience or something that just kind of um I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to ask. For me, it's like when I when I see a landscape, for instance, um, or I, I hear something or I see somebody's reaction, like the sale doesn't really get it for me. 
But when I when I'm in an exhibition and somebody's reacting to the work in the way that I react to the subject, not necessarily the painting, but to my subject, and I see sure. that through that work they get it. You know, to me, some of those experiences really stand out to me. When you look you back can, on you, the, sorry, sorry, you, you you can you can tell, can't you, when the reaction yeah. is really genuine and they're moved by it. And and I'm with you. That's that's the best. That's mm. always the best. Um, and I agree with you also that certain locations when you arrive there and you just you're just gobsmacked you it's you're dumbfounded as i was just then thinking about places like the mitchell falls and uh, some some of that kimberley coastline you know it's it's unreal it's too good to be true Mm, mm. and and i i can't think of i'm sure i will as soon as we hang up but (laughs) i can't think of any one specific moment that just totally floored me um there will be, there will be, but I might have to get back to you on that. <laughs> hey, you know, as I said earlier, anything over a week ago is very hazy. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, that's all good. I mean, no, I just, I, I, I like throwing that one in there, you know, um, just, just on the off chance because I, I, I tend to be, especially nowadays more than ever like i'm finding now that i've moved in i've set roots down you know we're we're about to start a family and i'm just finding on myself getting more and more emotional and more and more in tune I, I tell you though something that that had a really interesting effect on me i saw this amazing documentary about andrew wyeth on youtube mm-hmm. um about his connection with his subject his fascination it was by michael palin and i'm a big michael palin fan me, but, me um, too. Yeah. Have you seen that documentary? No, I haven't. Oh, you'll I'll have, go looking for it. Yeah, I have to check it out. Just go Andrew Wyeth uh, documentary. Yeah. It'll come up on YouTube. But one of the things that really struck me about Wyeth is that he could see things um, that were just in the everyday um, and is not particularly profound, but he would find the profound in something mundane and it was his job yes. to bring this up and say look at this this is amazing it, it would just be a bit yeah. of wood or a bit of wire or you know a landscape which is a little bit of snow it's simple simple stuff take, yeah yeah take time to look at the simple stuff i i don't wish to any way compare myself to him but that that idea of of looking at everyday stuff and trying to appreciate it more this ipad project has forced me to do that because i have to paint something every day and every day i'm might not do much you know i might be just here working on something else or having a nice meal with my wife julie or something and it's it's that in fact one of the days i ended up painting this table that we're sitting at now as the day's subject because julie and i had a fantastic lunch on it Mm. and it's a beautiful table shall i show you yeah yeah please well it's an interesting table i don't know if beautiful is the right word oh wow oh wow what is that made of? That looks like all kinds of different. Uh... It's uh, it's um, well, it used to be a Balinese boat. Wow! Yeah, cool, mm. cool. With, so that's that's the original paint on on it. So uh, it's gradually falling off, but it's fantastic. Yeah, mm. it's interesting the way artists look at things. I, I when I speak to other artists, finding out what makes them tick, and and you always see, you know, the artist is always kind of looking for that little bit of texture, a little bit of color, a little bit of depth or space, mm-hmm. and just just triggered by something. And they're they're like, hey, you see that? And you're like, no, what the hell are you looking at? And, you know, it's like, <laughs> that just looks so amazing. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that, I guess that's our gig. That's what we have to do. Yeah. That's it. That's it. That's the, that's the best thing about it. Hmm. Hey, look, um, thank you. I, I'm I'm more than thrilled with what we have there, Brendan. Um, thank you again. Uh, it's just You're, such it, such an honor, mate, to to finally meet you. I mean, it, it it is great fun. I've really enjoyed it. And don't hesitate if you think of something we haven't covered that we should. Just yeah, we'll do it. Yeah, yeah. look, no problem. It, it, it's um. No, I, I just remember. I remember that night. Uh, I, it was back in 2005, I think it was. It would have been 2005. And I was mm-hmm. showing at showing mm-hmm. Gallery 360 and um, in Subi. And, and the group was there. And Challen was there. And Toddle was there. And Kursop was there. And I, I met a lot, of, a lot of other people. And I was waiting. When's Brendan Darby showing up? You know, because I just wanted to shake your hand and say, I'm that guy that emailed you, you know. And, um, oh, you know, but um, I, I mean that. I'm not just blowing smoke, mate. Like uh, that—that that meant so much that you got back to me, and 
and um, I, I, really I will take the time. I will take credit for everything you do now. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, and I'm very proud of, of, of what I've achieved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's just you know a bit like yourself. You know, I've been very lucky. I feel blessed, and and that's what's given the idea for this um, podcast. I just hope that um, people get something out of it. And it's a chance to give back. You know. Yeah, I, I agree. It's a fantastic idea. Yeah. And I look forward to seeing the interviews with everyone else you do. It's awesome. going to be a great series. Oh, there you go. Well, look, uh, I, the, before before we finish this thing off, I want to I want to give the floor to you, Brendan. Um, you know, thanks again for agreeing to do the podcast with me and, um, you know, sharing your oh. stories and, and, you know, your it's insights. It's a pleasure. Um, but uh, look, is there, is there anything that you might, maybe I could pitch the question this way. If you had an opportunity, I mean, because we all have 2020 vision in hindsight, right? If you could go back, sit down with your 21 year old self and say, listen, mate, this is what you got to do. <laughs> we're, we're, I mean, it's a bit of a loaded question. Some people wouldn't do anything, but what would you, what advice would you give to your younger self? Mm, that is a good question. It's, it's particularly difficult to answer because, as I said earlier, I've been so lucky. My timing getting into the music business and then the art world was ridiculously good. It, the, the painting market had just started to pick up in Perth and galleries were opening and the economy was booming up until 1990. It was perfect. Um, and so I, I guess... The only thing I, I wish I'd known is it's not going to be perfect forever. So make hay, you know, while things are going well, just get on with it and have, have fun because it's, as you know very well, the tough times are a coming. Yeah. And uh, I, I wish I'd known a little bit more about that because it was all too easy for me. I, I'm, I don't want to oversimplify it. It wasn't easy, but but it was the perfect environment. I was so lucky. In fact, I've been lucky my whole life to be able to do what I do. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, look, that was, yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much again for joining me on the podcast. Brenda Darby, where can people find out more about your work? Where can they find you online, your website? What do you... Okay, well, I'm brendandarby.com. That's the website. And that will direct people to um, all the galleries I have shown. Um, uh, I'm on social media you can look me up there um, send me a message I'd love to reply and thank you for the invitation to be involved in this this is good fun I hope I hope some of it makes sense to up and coming artists and I uh, hope they get a little something out of it I hope well it's been a treat for me I can tell you that much it's been an absolute pleasure thank you me too thanks Andrew thanks a lot Now, I really hope that you've enjoyed this episode of The Creative Endeavor, and if you did, then please hit that like button for me. If you wanna come back for more, see some of my painting instructional videos, or see more of The Creative Endeavor podcast, then make sure you subscribe to this channel. As always, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook, but most important, make sure you're subscribed through my website at andrewtischler.com. Thanks so much for stopping by, and I'll see you again soon.